Okie dokie. Okay, why don't we? Uh, oh, no, keep talking. I forgot. I got another check. Keep talking. Keep talking. Okay, now we can start. I think, all of, I think everything's set, right? Right, right, right. Perfect. My AV team, audio visual. Let's pray. I knew once I knew once I got them started talking again, it'd be a little tough. Okay, let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for um, uh, the gift of fellowship, the gift of talking and uh, following and shipping along with all our brothers and sisters here this day. As we, uh, as you call us together, we are taking a look at your word in uh, Revelation, the one revelation that you gave to John and help us, Lord, to continue to find comfort in this and uh, learn more about what you're doing, even though we can't know everything. Uh, we do know that you are in control. So continue, Lord, to bless our time uh, this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Okay, well, just as a reminder, let me, uh, last week, and I'm trying to get this stuff on, 
YouTube. I got chapter seven. I got last week's on there. Beats me. He may have turned it off. Okay. And I'm getting them up there just to get them up there. So they're nothing fancy, but I'll keep working on it. Um, and, and put other copies up there when they get better. Anyway, so seventh seal and seven trumpets. That's what we're on. And we're in Isaiah. In, Isaiah, in um, what are we in? Revelation, right? Okay, Revelation 8 and 9. And so just a review. Let me get there. We covered the first three verses because we also had the uh, voters meeting last week. And so um, just a review uh, on... Uh, Revelation 8, verses 1 and following. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in the heaven for about an hour and a half. And uh, let's see. Then I saw the seven angels who stood, um, who stood before God, and the seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. And he had given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints, on the golden altar before the throne and the smoke of the incense with its prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashings of lightning and an earthquake. So remember that when you study your Bibles, or you're reading them, prepositions are big. You know, it's in the hand, it's, on, it's from the altar, it's on the earth, things like that. Just a quick review, because I don't want to take up too much time, but I want to get back to where we're at, where we were. Understanding the background of uh, a number of these things, including Revelation, it's uh, a lot of things are drawn from the pseudepigrapha. The pseudepigrapha is a writing, a pseudo writing. Um, these give us insight into um, a lot of what was going on in ancient times. Uh, it also gives us a good understanding of how did God's people believe or understand things. We looked at first Ezra and uh, some of that, which is not in our Bible, but it's, you know, part of the apocrypha, it's part of the pseudepigrapha, you know, there's these different writings that we can learn from. And we took a look at um, how they also had sort of this apocalyptic futuristic sort of understanding of faith and God and what was going to happen. Um, here again too, uh, that's part of that. The Apocrypha, we also learn in first Enoch 20 and then another one that there's seven angels. And who are the seven angels? Well, there's seven archangels. And we have two of them in our Bible. Two of them we have you know, we know as Gabriel and Michael. And then, you know, the bad joke in the King James Version is, lo, the angel of the Lord, you know, from Luke chapter two. But that's, you know, he's not a real angel. I, that one just dropped like an egg, didn't it? Oh, okay. I'll scramble it. I'm not, I'm not that, uh, you know, I, I, I'll do it. But there are seven archangels um, that we learn about. And so we've got Uriel, Raphael, who's not the painter, Michael, Gabriel, um, and then we have uh, Raguel, and he's Italian. He makes spaghetti sauce, and Remy Ale, and Siri Ale, right? So we have all these Ale guys. And remember, Ale on the end means God in Hebrew. So you know, it's something of God. Each one of them has a separate job, okay? Because when we take a look at M Michael, he's the military dude, right? So he's the military guy in the Bible. He's the one that we'll meet in uh, Revelation chapter 12. Is it working? Okay. Uh, he's the one we'll meet in Revelation 12. I think he's also the one that we meet in Jude uh, when he's wrestling with Satan over the body of Moses. So he's in there. Gabriel is always there. He's the announcer, the uh, messenger angel. He's the one who comes to Mary and Joseph and says, oh, Mary, uh, blessed are you. And blessed is your fruit. You know, so it's good. You know, uh, who says you're going to have a baby. Okay. He's also there at Easter. So he's the messenger guy with all the good news. And uh, we don't have the other angels in there, but you know, ancient you know, the ancient understanding is that there's seven of these. Well, we got seven angels in Revelation. They're not named, but 
uh, you know, they're the archangels and they're doing stuff. Then I think that's where I ended up. So now we also have chaos. And if you live in our house with all the kids growing up with nine people in a small two bedroom house, you'd know what chaos is. Um, so let's just take a look at this because I'm trying to figure out what verse this would be at. But there's chaos going on. And who is this chaos? We just think of it as sort of a, an event or something that happens. But also chaos is spelled, this is chaos transliterated into English. This is what it is in Greek. And in the, in the ancient times in pagan religions, there was a god called uh, chaos. Chaos. Chaos is how we would do it. And so, you know, this is one of these gods that would shape the lives of pagan people. Well, who is this guy? It's a Greek word chaos related to chino, uh, uh, um, which means grape or excuse me, gape or yawn. So picture a huge yawn that's going to swallow up a big gaping mouth. Okay. Literally means chasm or yawning space. So try to think of something like that. It's not like, oh, I'm tired. It's like, I'm going to swallow. That's chaos. A big yawn. Okay. There were various conceptions of it in the Greco-Roman antiquity because in various uh, mythical cos uh, cosmogenies, cosmogenies <laughs> chaos, that's with a capital C, the god, played a very different role. The word occurs only twice in the Greek Bible. Whoop. In the Greek Bible, ah, come on now, Mike, where is it? In the Greek Bible. Now, remember, um, and it's in Micah chapter one and in Zechariah chapter 14. So when you take a look at that, you know, um, we have our English Bibles and then we know that the original language is the Hebrew. So there's a Hebrew Bible, but there's something called the Septuagint. And I've mentioned this before. The Septuagint has its initials because this is 50 plus 10 plus 10 equals 70. I won't go into the 70 part, but it's Septuagint. And this is the first translation of the Hebrew Bible because people weren't speaking Hebrew or understanding it. So they translated it into the language of the day, the universal business commerce language, which was Greek. Okay, so in Micah 1, uh, they're going to have the word chaos there in Greek. So that's what will be there. That's what's being said here. Okay, I'm just doing a quickie connection here, just so you know what is being talked about here. And, um, and so you get that in Micah and Zechariah. Each time as a translation of the Hebrew word for valley. And two times uh, in First Enoch 10 and Jubilees, which is Dead Sea Scroll stuff, where, um, where it seems to be used for the abyss. So now we're starting to get this picture of chaos. Chaos is a big yawning thing, right? A picture larger than Jaws. Go back to the 70s. You know, Jaws coming. Dun, 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 you know, it's much bigger than that, where, you know, the jaws of hell and damnation and suffering is opening up, waiting to swallow up everything that it can. That's the picture of chaos, because um, this is where it was used for the abyss, where the evil angels have been incarcerated forever. So that's their place. God created it for them. The modern sense of the word is disordered, and it was developed only slowly, and it's not attested before the later imperial. You don't have to know about that. But we get our word chaos from there, and it developed over time. And again, this comes from this uh, book I got. Uh, Erdman's publishing company does a lot of Christian scholarship stuff, and it's from the Dictionary of Deities and Demons. If you look for this, I told, I think I told you that the cheapest hard, uh, hardcover copy I could find is four or $500. So I don't know why, but if you can find it differently, 
go ahead. Mine's electronic. I got it for 30 bucks. Now we got this thing uh, with a program. So now it's Tartarus. Now what, what, what in the world is Tartarus? It doesn't go with fish fries. By the way, this is what, the last time you're gonna have your fish fry this week up at Holy Family or any other Catholic church? Yeah, fish fries. I love fish fries. I love beer battered fish with tartar sauce, but not tartarium, okay? So what is kind of going on again with chaos and all this stuff? Chaos is a cosmog cosmogonic factor or principle that does not occur in the Bible, although the statement does in Genesis 1 verse 2. What is this? Well, in creation, uh, there were, in Hebrew, it's to, tohu vabohu, and it just means um, uh, that there was chaos that covered the, the darkness. Do you remember that in uh, Genesis 1 verse 2? So, you know, there was nothing there but chaos and whatnot. So this is kind of that too. But that chaos is good stuff, not bad stuff. But this word occurs there, okay? Um, and the LXX, Tiamat, I won't go into Tiamat, but that's a Babylonian uh, creation story. So in this connection, it's interesting that Philo of Biblos, uh, in his rendering, let me just get to something that's normal. Um, much of this formulation may be due to the interpretation of creation. Yeah. Yeah, they need to spell that word out, that word chaos. Write it out. Chaos. C H A O S. Right here. That's okay. At least you've got something in your head. I don't. <laughs> Chaos. C H A O S. Okay. Got it? You betcha. Okay. So, anyway, chaos is in the Bible. And um, in an apocalyptic event, chaos sometimes functions as an element in the eschatological cosmic upheaval. Again, eschatology is. What's happening on the last days? What's happening on the last day? Uh, it's going to be an upheaval. We know that. We hear it in the Bible. But there's stuff that's happening before that. As may be seen, for example, in Ezra 4, uh, I mean, 4th Ezra 5, where it is said that in the end time, in many places, an abyss or chasm, which is, you know, a Latin word going through the Greek chaos, will open up from which sub terrestrial fire will break out. So we're seeing this already in Revelation, aren't we? Where all of a sudden the keys of Sheol were open, hell was opened, and what came out of the abyss? The, there's four of them. The four horsemen. So we already see this kind of happening. They would understand this back in John's day because this was the worldview and understanding they had of how things were working, okay? Uh, we've lost that over 2,000 years, but that's why it's good to find out what's going on, because this stuff still happens, okay? Because remember, you know, just because we're removed from 10,000 years, 2,000 years, we are still living the way God created. There's the earthly and the mundane stuff that we can see and touch, and there's the spiritual. He never got rid of the spiritual just because we're enlightened and smart. The spiritual still happens. Spiritual warfare is going on right here, even though we can't see it. Evil angels and God's angels are here. So we are living in this battle of chaos every day. Uh, this may explain why the Septuagint translators twice uh, chose chaos for Micah 1 and Zechariah 14. But we also remember that uh, it's the feet of the Lord that will stand on Mount Olives, uh, the Mount of Olives, and the Mount will be the cleft in uh will be cleft in two by an immense chaos stretching from east to west now remember everything is always under god's feet isn't that yeah. yeah so even when it seems like chaos is going on god is in control the eschatological chaos as a place of eternal torment we see that in first enoch 10 see above i think i have it on your sheets and it parallels the second peter 2 verse 4 where uh, it says that god did not spare the angels who sinned, but consigned them to the dark pits of Tartarus, 
What is Tartarus? Oh, come on. And Tartarus is that sort of, did I put that on your sheet? Do I have it on there somewhere? Tartarus is that big open gulping place that where everything comes from. You don't want to go there. There's not enough marshmallows or chocolate to make s'mores for eternity. So you don't want to go there, okay? Um, huh? Yeah, that's the abyss and, you know, Tartarus, you don't want to be there. It's a dark pits, okay? Any questions or comments so far? That's sort of the... Yes. Okay. So that holy angel is over the world and also over Tartarus. Okay. So he's that guy. I forgot the name of him, but he's that one. Uriel. Uriel. Okay. So he's the one that's over the earth and over Tartarus. You got Michael, who's the military guy. You got Gabriel, who's the uh, messenger. You got Raguel, who does all these different things. And you've got Uriel, who's over Tartarus. So these angels are all at God's beck and call. Yeah. I think it's kind of the same sort of name. It was like Shaol, uh, Hades. You know, it's got all these different names. I believe so, yeah. I believe so. Now let's take a look at the silence thing, verse one, when the lamb opened up the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. So it was 30 minutes, right? Not an hour and a half, but half an hour. What is this? Well, there was a silence in heaven and uh, these angels were going on. Um, I saw the seven angels, verse two, who stand before God and the seven, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense, etc. The silence takes them back to the silence that I mentioned last week, I believe, that was there before creation. It was understood that before creation, there was silence. And so now we see the silence again, because God is doing something. We're going to be hearing about destruction and all these other things, but also there's this new creation. That's what, uh, you know, spoiler alert, this is what, you know, happens in Revelation 21 and 22. Jesus returns and everything is returned back the way God intended it to be in the restored creation, the new creation. So there's silence. So you got this kind of stuff going on. This 30 minutes, this half an hour is not a literal time, but it means for a short time amount of time okay in revelation 8 verses 1 to 5 now we got the cool angels then we got the one angel so we got one angel and then we got and we got the other seven angels and their trumpets they're the brass section um what's going on while well, they've got these sensors and i got a picture of that i think in your handout so um Brandon, do you have a handout? Do you guys have a handout? Okay, good. So I, you know, I, I love archaeology. I've got magazines and books and all this stuff um, that, that work with this stuff. And this is one of the sensors from way back, okay? This is a Coptic sensor dating around to the age of the Byzantine period. So it's, at, it's you know, after John. Portrays the tomb of Jesus with columns, entrances, and a dome. A cross replaces the knob depicted on the other Byzantine representations of the sepulcher dome. The motifs are similar to that on Byzantine uh, ampulla. So see photograph and there it is. So this is a censer, this is prayers. You know, I married a uh, Catholic, she's RC now, she's a recovering Catholic, um, you know, and, <clears throat> I was raised, you know, Midwest German Lutheran. So we don't do the smells and bells. Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> smells and bells. I am not high church. I respect high church. One of the things I like are sometimes the smells and bells. And it's not just Catholic. 
<laughs> just so you know, just so you know, it's Old Testament. Join us in Leviticus, uh, either Wednesday at nine thirty or online at six thirty on Thursdays. That's that's what I'm teaching. But anyway, that you know these these incense goes all all the way back to the tabernacle with the forty uh, with the uh, journey uh, through the wilderness. The tabernacle uh, they they swing the incense. Uh, the incense is burned because it's prayers going up to the people. I've said this before. You know, it's a very beautiful thing. We're not used to it as Midwestern Lutherans. I'll bet you dollars to know us. You're not really used to it as Western uh, Lutherans either because, you know, Westerns are more mavericks. So uh, that's why we live in the West. So, um, but this is what it was. And this is sort of a, a sensor, a bowl that they put incense in, light it, and then they'd uh, use the incense, swing the incense, and do different things, as these would be prayers that would go up to God. So here's sort of a picture image of what's in, included in this uh, in this reading. Romaine? Yeah? Uh, I went to a, few, a Catholic funeral for a little girl, and they had so much incense that went along with that funeral, and then the process, <laughs> the procession that came down the aisle that, that my daughter and I were there, and I said, we didn't know if we'd ever be able to stand another Catholic <laughs> funeral or not with all of that incense. Well, Mary, that was at your uncle's, did they have that at your, at all the funerals? I wasn't there for them. Okay, yeah. Greek Orthodox uses incense too. I love incense, but I think, you know, I don't want to put off the smoke, smoke alarms. We used it a little bit in, uh, we used it in, uh, when I was a pastor in uh, Lexington at St. John's Lutheran in Lexington. And uh, one of the associate pastors, you know, he liked incense. I said, sure, let's try it once. But we had to make sure we covered, we had to make sure that we covered Smoke alarms. smoke alarms because I didn't want this is what happened once um this was right before Christmas I was doing a wedding of a gal who was a firefighter <laughs> she was a firefighter okay keep this in mind and so on her wedding day somebody went down into the ladies kitchen Ooh, you never go into the ladies kitchen you don't move anything in the ladies' kitchen. You don't use anything in the ladies' kitchen. You don't use their coffee. You bring your own coffee. Somebody dared to go in there and use something that they weren't supposed to. And they were toasting something that started burning right before the wedding. And the alarms go off. And the firemen come with their trucks and everything else right before the fire, uh, right before the wedding. So what do you do? You invite them to the wedding because one of their own is getting married in about 45 minutes. Come join us. So uh, they turn off the alarm and everything else. But anyway, incense, I don't know how I got there. I think it's beautiful. It creates asthmatic things. And so we don't. But that's the way it goes. Anyway, that's the picture of that, what's going on there. Here's a picture of the incense, okay, that probably would have been used. Um, and it's used in many religious ceremonies, okay? Here we got them swinging the incense. You don't see any Roman Catholic on this angel, do you? Okay, so it's not Catholic. It's biblical. So we have this going on. Um, also then, let's take a look then. Let me start reading it. Then the angel took the censer and filled it in verse five. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the, uh, on the earth. So you, the altar is really important. The altar is uh, God's presence. When we take a look at Leviticus in the Old Testament, the altar also uh, is that place for sacrifice, where sacrifices happen. So either animal sacrifices or gift offerings and things like that. The offerings always put on top of the altar and the altar fire could never, ever, ever go out. It could never go out. That was the job of the priests. The attending priest made sure that that fire was going 24-7. We have an eternal light. That represents, that connects us to Leviticus. It never goes out because that's God's presence. And God lit that fire from way back when. So now we have 
this connection here with heaven and earth through the altar. And then we have the fire uh, in there that's burning the incense. And these also are the prayers of God. So you got the prayers of God that are that sacrifice on the altar. Is this making a connection? Is this making sense? Okay. And now then, so this is a very holy thing. And what does the angel do with this stuff? He takes it. And he pours it out. He throws it on the earth where there are peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. It sounds bad, doesn't it? And it is bad. But that judgment is connected directly to the prayers of God's people from the altar. God is working his thing. God is working his promises. God is working his judgment. And he's working not only on behalf of himself, but also on the behalf of God's people who are praying for an end. Does that make sense? So this is the law side of, of gospel, okay? He's, he's working his gospel, but it's just in a weird way that we're not used to seeing. Now we got six through 12. Now the seven angels come in. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. The first angel blew his trumpet and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth and a third of the earth was burned up and a third of the trees were burned up and all the grass burned up. The second angel blew his trumpet and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures of the, in the sea died. Excuse me. And a third of the ships were destroyed. So you got land and sea going on right now, right? A third angel blew his trumpet, and great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and the springs of the rivers. The name of the star was Wormwood. A third of the, um, and by the way, anybody here uh, read C.S. Lewis uh, screw tape letters? Okay, Wormwood is the uncle or the nephew? I think so. Yeah, he's the antagonist, Wormwood. So Lewis, uh, C.S. Lewis stuff is really good. So it's Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the night uh, and a third of the day may be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. Then I looked and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blasts of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. So now we've got something going on here. You've got two episodes that are happening. Angels one through four, notice what they're dealing with. They're dealing with land. They're dealing with sea. They're dealing with the universe, with sun and stars. Nothing is going to be unaffected by this judgment. In other words, everything's going to be affected by this judgment. This one third business is not a literal number. One third is a lot, but is it a hundred percent? Correct, it's not a hundred percent. And so what this one third means is there's gonna be destruction, there's going to be stuff happening, but it's not going to be completely consuming. The reason for this third here and a third there is to bring people to repentance because we're going to see it with the other angels, okay? It is to bring people to repentance. We have to go through this. Now, with all this destruction and stuff going on and uh, going, things going on spiritually in people's lives and things like that, this is a call from God personally to them to repent because it ain't going to get any better, okay? And I want to save you, but you're you're damning yourself unless you repent. And we'll see that a lot of them still didn't, and a lot of them still don't today, okay? So this is what the first four trumpets are dealing with. 
Then we have, let's see, do I have my sheet? I think I got my sheet. There it is. So let me take a look at some of these angels. We take a look on page three. You've got angel one, that's hail and fire. That harkens back to, um, you know, a lot of these will harken back to the 10 plagues in Egypt. Remember how those are. The 10 plagues were to uh, crush Pharaoh's heart in, in order to let his people go. There was redemption and freedom that was being worked out through these plagues by God to get people released. In a far greater way, God is working through these plagues currently to have people repent and be released so that they get the great exodus with Jesus, the great deliverance, the spiritual deliverance. So this revelation stuff is happening. It's got a connection to the Old Testament, um, the Old Testament uh, plagues, but it's always fulfilled in Jesus. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. And so he's using some of this imagery here. So angel one gets hail and fire. That's one of the plagues, right? And mixed with blood, that's one of the plagues. Uh, it probably indicates God's appeal for repentance. You got one third of the earth is burned up. It indicates that what God is carrying out is not total destruction. So as freaked out as our people got, it's not a total destruction. It's not going to, you know, Christ has to return first. We have to see him with our own eyes first before the rest of everything happens. And when he had, and like I said last week, when Jesus returns, there's going to be the separation of the sheep and goats. You're okay. You're doing fine. You're the people on, you're one of the sheep. You're on the right. He'll say to you, come you who are blessed by my father in heaven. So don't panic. Don't worry. Okay. That's the whole point of revelation. Okay. Angel two, a third of the same, a third of the sea becomes blood. It harkens back to the Egyptian plague uh, when the water uh, turned to blood, okay? Angel three, the great star, okay? Uh, a third of the living creatures died. God is Lord over all the waters. Fresh fish, uh, fresh waters are affected at this third trumpet blast. Wormwood is a bitter herb or herb, if you want to call it that way, but it's herb, silent H. Wormwood is a bitter herb. The waters made bitter by it bring death to many, though wormwood is not poisonous. So it's going to get them sick. Okie dokie. Let's turn the page. Angel number four. Sun was struck. One third of the moon, stars, and light are darkened. Now the sun, moon, and stars are darkened. This is like the terrifying ninth plague, the plague of darkness in Exodus 10. The first four trumpet angels carry out their tasks over nature. The next ones, five, six, and seven, are going to carry out their task over the spiritual realm that affects all people, okay? So, you know, uh, I, this italicized part, what, you know, these catastrophes, and here we got to kind of, you know, we live in the 21st century, we have 21st century science and everything else, which is great because, you know, in the Midwest, it helps predict tornadoes, you're trying to get better at that, so it's not as destructive, you get hurricanes, we can find out about hurricanes, all kinds of different things, but, but, are those from mother nature? See, if we start talking about mother nature, well, that's a goddess. We ought to be talking about sister nature. Because we are a part of creation. It's not mother nature that controls us. Sister nature is a part of what was created with us. And God is in control. And sometimes it's hard for us to wrap our heads around, okay? Because we don't get it. Why would God send a tornado? Why would God send a hurricane? This is what Revelation is about. And we as Christians need to try to wrap our head around it because we're separated from this worldview by 21 centuries. And especially, you know, if you're in science or medicine or math or something like that, where you've taught at a university, because I was 
pastor at um, uh, UK in Lexington, Kentucky. I have professors there. And it's really, it, it's interesting that, you know, it's great to have Christian professors who get it. But I have a, uh, there was one guy, he was a PhD student. He was one of the only Christians in there, uh, in that program. And he always came dressed to eight o'clock service in his suit, everything very respectfully. Uh, and, and remember him, Cameron Jones. Yeah. We share a birthday. And, uh, <laughs> but, you know, he, he did, his PhD was on how do you connect artificial lungs to work naturally? <laughs> Breathing. You know, and that was his PhD. And then he went on to invent some, uh, uh, invent a stint that goes into a gasket that goes into stints that will say that saves an additional 10% of lives. If my, if I put my key in the car and turn it, it doesn't work, I'm lost. This guy knows everything. And if you've ever gone on PhD work or other science or math work, you know that if you're a Christian, you're in the minority and you will be made fun of. And they will try to crack your faith and destroy it. But you can be a Christian in math and engineering and science and medicine and, um, and, and still use that paradigm. And so here then we have to use this paradigm and not get scientific. <laughs> Revelation is calling us to understand that God is in charge of tornadoes, of uh, destruction, of, of fires that came out here last year or the year before. Are those natural? Did Mother Nature take this on? Well, in a way, God uses nature, and they started on fire. Lightning. You know, lightning from the sky. So I'm trying to help us understand and sort of develop a, a little different worldview like the ancient people had, because it still exists, okay? It's just that we know more now with science, which is also a gift from God. So we have this going on and all these different things. Now, 813. 813, we get this weird um, intermission, this weird interlude. Do you know what an interlude is in music? It's sort of this quiet transition from one section of the symphony to the next uh, section of the symphony. It's a transitional piece or a few measures or a verse or something like that. This is what's going on here in 13. This eagle comes out of nowhere and he goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. What is this about, right? So the eagle separates the first four angels from the last three angels. The first four dealt with God's judgment through nature. The last three will be far worse because they deal with demonic realm. These woes are uttered upon the inhabitants of the earth. People with minds set on earthly things. Isn't that what Paul says? See, this is, you know, remember Paul has this apocalyptic worldview. <clears throat> he thinks like this. It shows up all in all sorts of places in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, I think the War Scrolls and some other scrolls. So when Paul is writing to people, this is how they understood the world. And this is why we get some of these writings. And this is still going on today. We ought to be understanding it like that. And so now, you know, do we have our, do we have our minds set on earthly things that, well, we can fix this problem over here. Yeah, we heard how God does it in the Old Testament, how he fixed wars and how everything came to the end. But that's bad, man. And I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. And so things are way different now. You get it, God, don't you? Is that right or wrong? See, God never changes, right? And so... Even stuff going on in our day and age today, you got to understand that God is behind it. He's working behind the scenes. That's why we too can take comfort in this stuff. Even though it's not easy, we take comfort because God is in control. So here we got this interlude in uh, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Are you living here on earth? Did you wake up dead or not? No, we all woke up alive, right? That means we're here in this earth. So this applies to us as well, what's going to be coming up. So we got the book of Revelation. You got a star, a key, and the bottomless pit. And now let's take a look at what's going on. Let's read uh, chapter nine now. 
And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I, I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was uh, given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft arose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened with smoke from the shaft. Then uh, from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. We saw that a couple of weeks ago. Remember, the seal is a tau. It made an X uh, in the Hebrew. It kind of moved into an X across You've got that mark upon your forehead and upon your heart in baptism, so you are marked by God. Um, they were allowed, verse 5, to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings somebody. And in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. That's horrific, right? You want to die and you can't even uh, die because death runs away from you. In appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle on their heads, were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces, uh, their hair like women's hair, and their teeth uh, like, women, uh, like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and, their, and the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. They have tails and, sting, uh, and stings like scorpions. And their uh, power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. They have as a king over them the angel of a bottomless pit. This uh, name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek is called Apollyon. Now, okay, so the first woe has passed. Behold, two more are still coming. The keys are given to this king. The keys are given to the king. Did the king have the keys before? If the keys are given to this king to open up the bottomless pit, did he have the keys no. beforehand? No. no. I, I'm going through this slowly because we can go through it so quickly that we miss points. So the keys were given to the king. In Revelation 1, who owns the keys? Jesus. Jesus owns the keys. He's giving the keys to this king who now opens up the shaft where all the smoke and this stuff comes from. Who still owns the keys? Jesus. So you need to start making these connections because the keys that locked it up, Jesus gives to the king and this king opens it up, the king of the netherworld and all this kind of stuff. And he opens it up Jesus allows this to happen. He's giving him the keys. This is weird. What's going on here? Why would God do something like that? Open up to Job. Put your finger here, as we say in Wisconsin. It's never finger. It's always nr, finger. Put your finger here. Open up to Job or Job. Job 1. Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs. Song of As it shows up, I may have it on your sheet as well. I don't know. But I want you to see this. Job is the oldest. It's believed to be the oldest extant writing known to man. Extant means discovered. Okay. So Job, even older than other ancient civilizations, Job is believed to be the one. The oldest writing, writing ever discovered out of anything, Egyptian, Babylonian, what you name it, Job is believed to be the oldest. Now, wow, it's even biblical. Cool. So God really is the ancient of days. So let's take a look at Job, okay? We know about Job. He had a really bad hair day, right? It was a bad Monday. He lost everything. He wakes up Monday morning. I am sitting on top of the world. I got a great family. I got a house. I got crops. I got sheep. I got goats. I got servants. I got a great family. And as the day goes along, you know, it doesn't get any better. It gets worse, right? So he's got all these different things going on. Um, and let me find where God says, 
Okay, let's take a look now at verse six. Uh, Job chapter one. Job chapter one, verse six. Now there was a day when the sons of God uh, came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan. Before the Lord. And Satan also was among them. Okay, these sons of God, way back in ancient time, are also believed to be sort of angels or angelic things. We see this in Genesis as well with the Nephilim. Okay, but we have this angelic sort of beings. So these are the ones who came to present themselves or come before the Lord, and Satan was also among them. Verse 7, and the Lord said to Satan, from, from where have you come? Here's preposition time. Okay, from where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on earth and from walking up and down on it. Where is this discussion taking place? In the heavenly realms. Satan has had access to the heavenly realms. The evil angels had access to the heavenly realms. We'll see that that's no longer it in Revelation 12, because that's where they get booted out. But there was a time, a long time, until Jesus ascended onto the throne, that's Revelation chapter 5, when the Lamb takes his throne, the war begins. But until then, Satan and the evil angels had access back and forth. Where have you come from, Satan? Oh, I came from earth, so now the conversation is taking place here in heaven. We don't think like that. We don't think about that. That he's actually there. We think he's barred. Well, yeah, he's barred now, but he had access. Now let's go on and see what God does here. Verse 8. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? Did you see the big target sign on him? Not from the department store? I'm going to put a target on Job. How about that, Satan? You know, God can do whatever he wants, but it's like, I'm trying to hide. I'm trying to hide from Satan. Please don't, don't point me out. Bam, there he is. You know, you ever feel like that in your life? Yeah. You know, it's like, I just don't want any of this. And it's like, I had a target on me. Couldn't I just hide God? No, you can't hide. Okay. So, verse 8. And the Lord says, Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man, who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for no reason at all? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed it, the work of his hands and his possession have increased in land. But God, here's the challenge, but stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will cause, uh, he will curse you to your face. That's the challenge. The Lord said, you betcha, you got it, okay? I'll take your challenge. Even though I don't need to get challenged, I'll take it and just prove you wrong. Behold, all that he has is in your hand. What did he just say? God said what? Oh, all that he has is in whose hand? Satan's. Satan's hand. We don't understand this because God's supposed to be loving and good and none of this bad stuff is supposed to happen. He's handing <coughs> Job over to Satan to do with as you want. Just don't kill him. Just don't kill him, because life belongs to God. He's in charge of everything, and he's allowing this to happen. So then he gets the bad hair day and everything else, but he comes out of it okay, right? He says, bless, I, naked I came into this world, naked I'm going to leave, blessed be the name of the Lord. So then, you know, they have this conversation again, and, you know, he goes, ah, oh, you gave him his health, of course he's going to be Go ahead, take the help. Do anything you want. Don't take his life. Because life belongs to God. And then if you remember, you got the boils from head to toe, the oozing wounds and everything else. It's so bad. Think about how bad this has to be. That he's there taking pot shirt, you know, broken pots, and scraping off the boils and wounds off the bottom of his feet so that he can walk. It's that painful. And he's got this from head to toe. And Job, and now his friends and his wife and everybody are saying, you know, maybe you should just give up, curse God and die. You know, there must be something there that you did wrong. Nope, not going to do it. Right? This is what's going on here. And we have a lot of spiritual things going on. And so we have 
um, you know, God is doing this here in Revelation as well. He did it in Job. It's nothing new, okay? Um, so we have the star that falls, uh, angel number five, and I'm on page four of the handout. Uh, angel number four, the star falls from heaven with the key to the bottomless pit. This fallen star represents a person, possibly Satan. And you can take a look at a cross-reference. This is what um, Jesus is saying to the disciples in Luke chapter 10. They say, I think this is when they just came back from their mission trip, so to speak. Like, wow, we're casting out demons and holding snakes. Oh, man, this is so cool, Jesus. Pull the phone, you know, and it doesn't belong to you. And he says, Jesus said to them, I saw Satan, Satan falling like lightning from heaven. So he knows, because he's God, he knows all this stuff that's going to happen. Satan eventually is going to fall from heaven. Revelation 12, that's what's happening here in Luke 10. It's important to remember that Jesus is the one who has authority of the keys to death and Hades. We have to remember this every day of our lives. That when bad things happen, God is still in charge, even when it seems like he's not in charge. He gave the keys to the king for the bottomless pit. Smoke rises from the shaft and these weird looking things come out, right? Scorpions and stuff like that. So what does this look like? Okay, so here we got, you know, I took a picture of this guy out in the desert last week. <laughs> it's so dry. They're flying around. No, the bluebirds are out. Those are kind of neat. So, um, you know, we got these weird pictures, you know, of this stuff, and it, it's really freaky looking, but what's the symbolism, okay? I've got it here in your sheet. They're like horses prepared for battle. So if you take a look at Joel, the Old Testament Joel, uh, prophet Joel, in his account, you have the locusts, and these locusts have speed like a horse. That's why he saw it like a horse. Uh, the head of the uh, locust is that of a horse. Then it's got a crown of gold, right? It's got a crown of gold, and that is that they are conquerors. So they lust for power. They got to feed on this stuff. And locusts, you know, they come in and they go out and they, they can wipe out a field of, uh, of wheat in no time, right? So they're fast. They got human-like faces, I dated a couple girls like that. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't have said that, but I did I did date one that I think she was like this. She was pretty, but she was <clears throat> not you, Mary. I married you. This is before you, honey. Long before the human face, suggesting intelligence and the capacity of man. Long hair like that of a woman. This may allude to the long antennae that he saw. Okay, and teeth like a lion. The general sense is that the locust of the abyss may represent to us memories of pasts brought home at times of divine visitation. Remember, this is spiritual stuff going on now, right? Angels five, six, and seven are dealing with the spiritual realm. This is important because we all have our pasts. We all have our sins, and we all go through spiritual warfare when the memories are dredged up from the past. Is that anything from water or trees or anything, or is that a spiritual thing? It works on spiritual stuff. Anytime, um, you know, uh, sometimes anxiety is brought on, and anxiety, this can happen. Okay, not everything can be solved with medicine, although medicine and uh, doctors are great gifts. But also we have to understand that maybe some of the things that we go through are spiritual warfare as well. Okay, and that's what, that's what some of these angels are about and these locusts. So these locusts are here um, and they're working spiritual warfare. So I think uh, under teeth of a lion near the end, uh, it says they will attack in, pe in people in the spiritual and mental realms of their lives. Maybe that's happened to you. I know it's happened to me. Yeah. I know it's happened to me. Physical health is affected by this. Have you ever been so mentally 
frustrated or free, uh, mentally gone where it just affects you physically, I've gone through anxiety and it ain't no fun. It leads to depression. It leads to eating away at the gut. It was not a good time of my life. Ask my family. It was a dark time. I never want to go there. That's part of spiritual warfare, okay? Because, you know, there's a lot of different things involved that maybe if you've gone through it, you know what I'm talking about. It ain't fun. But that also is spiritual warfare, okay? That's a part of it. Now let's go on. Psalm 23, 3, Psalm 32, 3. I think I preached on this a couple of weeks ago. For when I kept silent, King David wrote, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as that of the heat of summer. If you're holding on to a sin, that is spiritual warfare. God, Satan can use that in our lives. He did it to David. Remember, David had that uh, affair with uh, Bathsheba. He had everything he could want in that kingdom, but no, he wanted the one thing he couldn't have. He has the affair. He kills Uriah. Every, every, nobody knows except me and Bathsheba and God. We forget about God and we want to keep this stuff in. And he kept this in and it was eaten away at his guts. You know, the spiritual warfare, nuts. I thought I'd be done before that. Sorry, Facebook friends. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I hope it's still on. We have to remember that, you know, the spiritual warfare, we got to get it off our shoulders, get it off our hearts, get it off our chest. He didn't do it. It ate away at him physically. And only after he confessed the sin to God, which God knew already. Remember, confession isn't telling God anything new. Confession is God wanting us to tell him what he already knows so that he can forgive us, right? And so this is what's going on here. This is why God gives us confession and absolution. And you have it there. Romaine? I think when God is trying to teach me is patience. I hate that. I just want to get on with things. Don't you, Romaine? I do too. And then I, he teaches me a new patience. I hate being taught patience. Yeah, it's a word. bummer. I know. So I don't, I, I don't pray for patience anymore because he's taught me a lot. Mayor? So is that what, so I didn't understand why. Huh? I didn't necessarily understand the lion's teeth and how that yeah probably eats away you know they're ravenous right they rip and tear you know it's not like taking a fine little fillet and cutting my asparagus no it's messy business tearing ripping right then you got the breastplate of right uh, the breastplate of iron so that was worn by goliath remember uh, goliath davy and goliath okay but remember how the true story ended? God was with David, and David defeated mighty Goliath. And then you got these wings that make uh, mighty noises like chariots. This noise uh, was the uh, was their attack. I want to finish the rest of this. Right here it says, I'm going to try to jump in. Job 4, 10. The lions may roar and growl, yet the teeth of the great lions are broken. The lion perishes for lack of prey. And the cubs of the lioness are scattered. Yeah. So there's all kinds of neat stuff. Yeah. Let's take a look at the rest of this. Because now verse 13 and following. I can go through this quickly. <clears throat> then the sixth angel blew his trumpet. And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God. Saying to the sixth angel who had a trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the for the hour, the day and the month and the year were released um, were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of mounted troops were twice 10,000 times 10,000. So it's like 200 million. Uh, I heard their number. And this is how I saw the horses in my vision and those who rode them. They wore breastplates and color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur and the heads of the horses were like lion's heads and fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths but these three plagues uh by these three plagues of a third of the uh, mankind were killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths for the power of the horses is in their mouth and in their tails for their tails are like serpents with uh heads and by means of them they, they wound 
The rest of mankind uh, were not killed. Uh, the plagues were not, uh, did not, uh, by these plagues, did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders of, or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. So they didn't do it. Now let's take a look. These are some of the weird looking things too, right? So you have this, you got the sixth trumpet, fifth, sixth, I must have missed something. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, this five month deal, this is a typical lifespan of a locust. So it wasn't going to last forever, okay, on page five. So I'm going back to the weird looking locust. The time period uh, suggests an on again, off again ordeal. So locusts come, they go, they come, they go. So this is how things are going to happen in this world. Have we known times of peace? And are we going through times of locust eating in this world? Yep. Number 11, uh, verse 11, the king is the angel of the bottomless pit. You can read that. Now I'm on, uh, you know, the sixth, uh, verse 13 through 19. You got angel number six, the golden altar before God, the trumpet call is issued forth. And so there was um, prayers of the saints that were wafting upward. I think I corrected this on my other sheet. I corrected, I corrected that on my other sheet, which I didn't print out. Okay, so you do have the four angels. Through judgment, God's mercy comes forth, and thus his kingdom comes. Okay, so now you have four angels at one of these trumpets. You got to understand that these angels were, were for that moment, that year, that month, that hour. Remember, angels serve God day and night. And these angels, you know, as like the archangels, each one has their separate duty and waits to hear from God. Here's four angels that God said, hold these winds back. I think we saw them earlier. So you got a picture, these mighty angels holding back destruction. Holding back destruction. Okay. That's what they've been doing since the fall into sin. Okay. You four, you take these corners and hold it back. So that's the imagery that's there. Judgment is being held back. If they would let it go, this world, you wouldn't even... You, you think things are bad if you a whole lot worse. There's a psalm like that, and I preached on it. I just heard it the other day. I forgot what psalm it is. Um, it's like in the 140s or something, but basically it's something like, goes something like, um, if God were not with us, and we think, oh, if God were not with us, oh, you know, at least we got it good. If God were not with us. No, what that psalm means, if God were not with us, you should see how really bad it would be because of sin if God were not with us. And that's that picture. We still have God in control through these angels holding everything back, okay? So um, the sixth trumpet in verse 13 is an altar reference. It, that's uh, eight, I'm sorry. You've got Revelation, Euphrates River. That's the Euphrates. It's a pretty area, I guess. I've never been there. Uh, Revelation 16 through 19, that's the last... Uh, of the horsemen that are there. There you get a nice picture. I didn't date any girl that was like that. Though. <laughs> Just the locust. But uh, honey, you are the crown jewel. You are one of the archangels. Don't worry about it. You're the love of my life. Before that, it was a disaster. Okay, so, you know, you can read the rest of that, but... Uh, the, the main point is the first four angels are over nature and how God works through nature and then God, how God works through in the spiritual realm, okay? It says out of here, out, oh, out, oh, you demons of stupidity. That's what it says if you're trying to read that. That's, uh, what's the guy's name? Cartoon, Dagger? Uh, huh? Yes, that's it. So uh, anyway, that's what it is. I hope this is helpful for you. We'll start chapter 10 next week. Easter, I probably will. No, I'm not going to have Bible class because we're going to have Easter dinner. I'm going to nap. How many here are going to come to sunrise service? Raise your hand nice and high.
Sunrise service, okay. You are the ones who also love to see the big circle, right? Yes. The big circle that moves its way across as the sun rises. Absolutely. Gosh, I remember that cross. Do you remember that cross? Yeah. Well, maybe someday. Okay. Oh, let's close at uh, six o'clock in the morning. Because the Bible says the woman came very early very early to the tomb before the sun rose so we have to do that too let's close with a blessing may the grace of god the love of jesus christ and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with us all amen Yes, they do. You'll turn it? Okay, thank you.